My name is Mark Hennick. I'm the author of So-Called Normal, a memoir of family, depression, and resilience, and I'm ready to start digging deep. I'm Mark Sutcliffe, and I'm on a quest to learn from the best. Welcome to Digging Deep, presented by Zen Books and Abacus Data. This is the latest in our series of one-on-one conversations in which thoughtful, accomplished people from many different fields share their stories and life lessons with us. And we have a very compelling and emotional journey to share with you on this episode. Our guest is Mark Hennick. Mark is a mental health advocate, writer, and public speaker. His TEDx talk has been viewed more than 6.6 million times. Mark has a new book. It's called So-Called Normal. And it's the powerful and very heart-wrenching story of his mental health struggles as a teenager. Mark attempted suicide several times, and it culminated in a life-changing incident on a bridge near his home in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. A man in a light brown jacket spoke to him on that bridge with empathy and eventually pulled him to safety. We'll get into the details of that story and Mark's later attempt to find that man. Mark also shares some remarkable and noteworthy lessons with us, including how he turned his struggle into his strength. We talk about gratitude. We talk about acceptance and change and about how if you are wrong, you are learning. Mark also shares his perspective on many aspects of how we treat and think about mental illness in our society. There are some really meaningful and insightful messages in what Mark has to say. I really believe you will take a lot from this conversation. Now, one last thing before we get started. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to the podcast and post a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And also, share this with your network. And if you're looking for more information on this episode, on the podcast in general, or if you want to read my daily blog, please go to let's dig deep.com that's let's dig deep.com now let's start digging deep with mark hennick mark it's a real pleasure to welcome you to digging deep i read your book and i have read about you and your story uh you're really changing lives with your message and uh, i'm really looking forward to our conversation so thank you Thank you. I'm really looking forward to it as well. I, I haven't um, really had many conversations yet with people who have actually gotten into the meat of the book. So uh, this is exciting for me too. Well, it's a very powerful story and you've shared it in a TEDx talk as well and, uh, and in other speeches that you've given. Um, and you've been such an advocate for mental health and for those suffering from mental illnesses. And uh, we have a lot to talk about uh, in, that, in that area today. So let's start with some quick questions, uh, beginning with what is your fondest childhood memory? And I know you've, uh, you've just gone through the process over the last few years of, of revisiting your childhood. So I know this, is a, uh, this, this may be more top of mind for you than it is for a lot of people, but uh, what is your fondest childhood memory? I would have to say my Nana Agnes's magic soup, the smell of her cooking as I walked in her, her house. That's, that's a nice fond memory. <laughs> Who was your hero when you were 10 years old? I was 10 years old, gee. I had just, I think I had just started uh, playing guitar at that point, and I was obsessed with Eric Clapton. Okay. <laughs> That's a good hero to have if you're playing the guitar. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what did you think you were going to be when you grew up? Eric Clapton. <laughs> <laughs> was it I a rock no- star? Uh, well, I have no idea, to be perfectly honest. I think, uh, you know, growing up in a small town like that, I didn't see much further than beyond those borders. Uh, so, you know, I think we'll probably get into that piece. Yeah. What is your life story in six words? Never, ever, ever, ever give up. <laughs> nice. What is your greatest mistake and what did you learn from it? Believing the lies that my depression told me, that I was worthless, that I was hopeless, that I would never amount to anything, I've learned to never give up uh, on believing in myself and and working on myself and proving myself wrong. For what do you feel most grateful? My family, a family that I never thought that I would 
ever have, uh, and now I do. So I actively practice gratitude for that. What's been the best year of your life so far and why? That's a, that's a hard question, I think, because surprisingly hard, because I, I think that I try to make every year uh, my, my best year in, in a new way. But I, I think it would have to be this year uh, in, in a strange way, a pandemic year, uh, because I'm finally getting this book out into the world. And this has been a, such a central part of my life for so long. It's amazing how many people actually have answered this year, despite the circumstances. Uh, mm-hmm. And, and I, I think there's, there's something in that, that, that we're, we're discovering things this year. We're, we're bonding with people in ways that we didn't before. So there's, there is a, as much as there have been challenges and difficulties this year, there's something else going on as well. Right. So. Yeah. And, and I've heard people refer or, or say uh, before that um, I think we're going to miss something about this year in a weird way. Once it's mm. all over and we go back to the, whatever the new normal will be, I think we'll miss some of this. Yeah. What was the toughest year of your life so far and why? And, and, I know from your story, you've got a lot to choose from here. <laughs> I've got a lot to choose from, but uh, I'd have to say hands down, uh, 2015, uh, when my mother died, uh, suddenly, unexpectedly. Um, I, I feel like in some ways my entire life of trial and tribulation up to that point was preparing for that moment. Um, so I, I think I'm a different person. I'm a better person because I made it through that, that year. What one person has had the greatest impact on your life? Well, again, there there have been a few, but uh, um, in in terms of their the most sustained impact, um, I've been with my wife now. We met in high school, uh, and we've been together for more than half our lives. So she uh, very gradually shaped this uh, this mountain <laughs> into into who it is today. Wonderful. What is the most important lesson that you've learned that you would share with other people? Not to believe everything you think that, that uh, thoughts, feelings, emotions are data, they're data points, um, and, and that we make our conclusions based on aggregates, based on, on trends, uh, not any individual thought. What would you say is the biggest factor that led you to where you are today? In a strange way, I think it's been my um, stubbornness. I don't know if that's the right word for it or not, or if it's persistence or if it's uh, resistance. Um, but having had so many difficult encounters, I think, both with the mental health care system and with people telling me that I couldn't or shouldn't do things, um, doing it anyway uh, has led to some of the most successful things in my life. So that, that willingness to do it anyway. What do you think people would be most surprised to learn about you? Uh, that I paid bills in college by making balloon animals and dressing up as a clown and entertaining at children's birthday parties. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that from the book, Mark. No, that didn't make the book. <laughs> a few friends in college remember me in, in my clown costume, uh, but I did it for years. And, you know, I'm kind of an introverted-ish guy, kind of a serious person sometimes, but I'm actually really very silly, I think. And, and it comes from that. Okay. Uh, what is your secret talent? Is it the, bo- the balloon animals? Maybe it would be the balloon animals. Um, I haven't done those in a long time, though. But yeah, I, I would have to stick with that one, I think. Okay. Uh, what is the most fun you've ever had? We, we, you know, uh, I only started because we never, I never had the opportunity to when I was a kid. Um, but I started going to Disney World um, at, as, a, as an older adolescent and then into my adulthood. And we actually, my wife and I went to Disney World for our honeymoon, uh, I guess, because we're still kids at heart. And I have to say, it really is much more fun as an adult, I think, than as a kid. It's so a great place for adults. Yeah. yeah, it's consistently the most fun place on, on earth. Yeah. <laughs> what is your boldest prediction for the future? That we will fundamentally change uh, the mental health care uh, service system in Canada. That, that change is still coming. Yeah, I hope you're right about that. What would be the message of your commencement address if you were speaking to a group of students right now? Never assume that you have it all figured out, that it can change in an instant. I say to myself all the time, this too shall pass. I think that applies equally to challenges and uh, to successes. Uh, so that that's a great lesson to um, hold on tightly to the things that you love and enjoy and uh, release lightly the things that are causing you pain. What has been a recent epiphany for you? Maybe something about which you've changed your mind. 
I try to change my mind. I try to, I've always set a goal for myself to try to be wrong at least once a day, because if you're, if you're wrong, you're learning. Um, and I think for me, uh, this appreciation that I think of has always been in the background, but more in the foreground lately, that everybody is on their own trip, that everybody in every mood in every day uh, is whether it's a power trip or a control trip or a joy trip or whatever it is, they're all at their own point on this little trip and you don't realize you're in it until you're in it or in, until you were just coming out of it actually. And I think that's really helped me to be able to step back and not necessarily fall into their um, whatever trip they're on uh, at that time. It's helped create some distance. What book other than your own are you most likely to recommend to other people? Oh, I have a few. Um, Full Catastrophe Living by John Kabat-Zinn is a, is a game changer. Um, I, I love uh, Joan Didion's two memoirs. I read those uh, repeatedly through the course of writing my own. Uh, Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott is funny. It's instructive. It's wonderful. Um, uh, uh, Angela's Ashes. I love the the voice. I think I really connected as a Cape Bretoner uh, uh, with the Irish lilt <laughs> of that writing style. I, there are so many. We could do a whole episode yeah. about books. Uh, the Year of Magical Thinking, is that one of the Joan Didion books The Year of Magical to? Thinking blew my socks yeah. off. I just, it was uh, the simplicity of it, but the uh, allowing the sentences and the, and the emotion to breathe, uh, I felt like was so impactful. And I, I strive to do some of that in my own. I don't think I, I accomplished it, but, but I strived for it. Yeah, and Bird by Bird, I just read that about two months ago, actually. It's mm -hmm. a great book about writing for anybody who's interested in in doing the kind of writing that you've just done. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's a great place to start. All right, Mark, thank you for answering those questions. We're going to take a short break. And in just a moment, we are going to start digging deep with Mark Hennick. We're just going to take a quick break so I can tell you a little bit more about the presenting sponsor of Digging Deep, ZenBooks. ZenBooks is Canada's go-to cloud accounting firm. They are not your typical accounting firm. I know the founders, Colin and Eric. I've worked with them for several years. And here's why I think you should consider working with them too. First of all, they bring a fresh, unique, modern approach to what is a very old-fashioned industry. These guys were working remotely and in the cloud long before it became cool. ZenBooks also uses technology to your advantage. I think this is really important. They give you the tools and analysis you need to monitor your business in real time. That's so valuable right now when everything changes so quickly. Yes, they're a virtual accounting firm, but that doesn't mean they're offshore and it doesn't mean they're inattentive. ZenBooks combines the efficiency and effectiveness of a cloud accounting service with all the benefits that you'd want from a trusted advisor, high level advice and strategic support. Now, here's what I think is going to happen if you work with ZenBooks. You'll probably start out taking advantage of their cutting-edge cloud accounting solutions, but in the long run, I think you'll stay with them because of their strategic guidance and problem-solving. Among their core values, they specifically list being candid and proactive. Isn't that exactly what you want from a trusted advisor? Look, even if you're already working with an accountant or a bookkeeper, or you have some accounting staff on your team, I think you should still talk to ZenBooks and learn more about their tools and their expertise. Check out ZenBooks at zenbooks.ca. That's zenbooks.ca. Digging Deep is all about helping you make better decisions, and so is Abacus Data. Most leaders struggle to connect with and engage their audiences. Why is that? It's because they aren't sure how they think and feel and how they will react. Abacus Data can give you the strategic insights you need to make better decisions and to make them confidently. Here's a good example. A major national union was recently negotiating a new agreement for its thousands of members. This had the potential to be a very difficult process. There were many competing interests. So they brought in Abacus Data to conduct thorough and detailed research of their members to learn exactly where they stood, what they were thinking, what they wanted. And as a result, they were able to secure 
a strong new deal that was accepted overwhelmingly in a national vote. Abacus Data helps all of its clients understand what's really happening in the minds of their employees, clients, and stakeholders. They help them avoid costly blind spots. And they're really good at what they do. In fact, Abacus Data was one of the most accurate pollsters in the 2019 Canadian federal election. Make the one decision that will improve all of your other decisions. Let Abacus Data help you move forward with confidence and clarity. Go to abacusdata.ca. That's abacusdata.ca. Mark, once again, thank you so much for joining us on Digging Deep. And you have such a powerful story to share and such a great perspective on mental health. And there's so much that I want to talk about. But I think it's important to kind of set the stage with your story. And can you talk about the moment you describe in your book when you were 15 years old and you're on a bridge in mm -hmm. Sydney, Nova Scotia, and you are saved by a man in a light brown jacket? Yeah, so I, I think um, so much of my my earlier childhood had led up to that one moment. It's a story that I share in uh, my TEDx Toronto talk, which ended up going viral all around the world, around how I had become suicidal, uh, and I felt hopeless and helpless, and and that like nobody could ever um, get me out of this dark spot that I, I had found myself in. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book w was to explain to people that when I climbed up over that railing and stood on that inch and a half or so of concrete, fully prepared to end my life, that that didn't come out of nowhere, that there was a whole, um, uh, it, to me, felt like a lifetime of struggle that led up to that moment. And, you know, I had been suicidal overtly since uh, I was 12. I was first brought to hospital when I was 12. But I think it had been bubbling up for a long time before that. Um, by the time I got to the bridge, I'd been in and out of hospital a half a dozen times. Um, I felt like uh, I had experienced trauma through uh, bullying, through uh, leaving home with my mother and then coming back and leaving and going back, you know, over and over. So I felt like I had no secure base uh, to call home. Uh, and I was struggling with these symptoms of of my mind, of my mind telling me, uh, alternating between uh, telling me that I wasn't good enough or competent enough, enough that I just wasn't enough, and then this this much more active, uh, I think, rage, aggression in my own mind against myself. You know, it's been said that that uh, depression is anger turned inward, and I very much experienced that. So by the time I got to that bridge that night, I I felt like nobody could help me because so many people had tried already, uh, or at least I thought they tried or tried to try. Um, and if it wasn't for a complete stranger who happened to see me, even though I think it was almost midnight on a Sunday night in March, um, he pulled over, he, he uh, approached me and talked to me. Uh, he didn't come up right next to me or rush up and grab me, at least not right away. Uh, and he just talked to me about the most mundane things, you know, my, my uh, um, subjects in, in school and my family and my parents and my pets uh, and my hobbies, um, just getting to know me kind of stuff. Uh, he clearly wasn't a mental health professional uh, because I had talked to so many that, that I knew what they sounded like um, until eventually I realized that as, as he was talking to me, uh, I started to realize how much my perception had collapsed in around that moment. And that seems to be one of the, the, um, uh, concepts in the TEDx talk that really took off was this idea that when you're in a mental health crisis, everything kind of folds in around you and collapses around you. Uh, so you can't see anything else. I could tell that the stranger was not a, a, a mental health professional of any kind because he, he was just talking to me like a regular person. And I felt like every mental health professional, I talked to dozens of them, were talking to me like I was a project or a broken down car on the side of the road just to be fixed. Um, and, and as I started to get a better, um, I guess, relax out of my collapsed uh, state that I was in a little bit, I realized that the police had arrived, they'd barricaded the bridge, uh, and that crowds had gathered, because in small towns like in, in Sydney, Nova Scotia, people listen to the police scanner <laughs> to see if there's any action happening that they can check out, I think. Um, and I remember that there was a group of young men um, at, over, over my shoulder at the uh, one of the barricades, and one of them shouted out for me to jump, and he called me a coward. And when he did that, I was I was literally on the edge anyway, but even metaphorically in my my own mind, I was on this edge between do I want to do this or or not? 
uh, and when he said that, I basically forgot about this stranger who was standing behind me, um, who I had only seen was wearing a light brown jacket. I couldn't see his face or anything like that. But he just kind of faded as I collapsed back into myself again. I let go of the railing uh, and started to fall. Uh, but it was that stranger in the light brown jacket who then reached out and grabbed me uh, and saved my life. Um, and I was brought back to hospital uh, again that night. I was loaded into the ambulance and they said later I found out that my body had just gone completely limp, like I had just given up uh, and just started to fall. And uh, I was brought back to hospital. I think I was admitted for 24 hours and I was discharged because by after about 24 hours, because I think by then I had just become you know, a, what's called a frequent flyer. Um, somebody who the more help they need, the less help they get, right? I, I was discharged. Nobody came to pick me up. I was told to just get a taxi home. Uh, I was told to check in with the psychiatrist on an outpatient, uh, for an outpatient appointment whenever he was available, but there was no real discharge plan, no, no treatment. Um, but it was the last time that I tried to kill myself. And as I reflected on that in writing the book, the, one of the main reasons why I wanted to write the book was to understand why, why didn't I you know, go back and do it? Or why didn't it continue after that? And what I narrowed it down to, I think, was that when I left the hospital that that uh, day, it was the first day of spring, uh, and I couldn't help but, but reflect on these two strangers who were watching the exact same situation unfold in front of them, but chose to respond uh, in two very different ways. You know, one was on the sidelines and chose to shout out and call me a coward and tell me to jump. And the other guy chose to stop and to reach out literally and to grab me and save my life. And I think that in a very small way, when I started to realize I could be more like that stranger who saved my life instead of the stranger who stood on the sidelines, I could be the one who reaches out to others. Um, I think that's when things started to change for me. I started to feel like I had a purpose, that my, that my suffering had a reason that I could do something with it. Uh, and from there, I think, you know, it wasn't a hallelujah moment. Everything stuff was still hard, but um, I think iteratively over time, uh, I got better and better at recovery. Uh, and that's when really things uh, started to change for me. And we'll come back to the guy in the light brown jacket. There's a, there's a great follow-up to that story. Um, but I have to say one of the things that, that created anxiety and emotions for me when I was reading your story was the fact that uh that you were already in the system, for lack of a better term, when this event happened, right? That mm -hmm. you, your, your illness and your challenges uh, had already been observed and, and there was treatment happening, and yet you still got to that point. And I, I find that scary as a, as a mm -hmm. human being, as a parent, I find that scary that this was not a case of somebody who was under the radar undiagnosed and and reached a point where he decided to take his own life you were being treated and yet you still got extensively to, yeah, yeah and you still well, got and to I this think, point yeah i think that really caused me to reflect on um uh, on when i wrote the book i pulled all my medical records uh from that time in my life and i laid it all i have a picture of it i took a few pictures of it i went away to a trappist monastery in the woods uh, and I, I lived there writing this book every day i spread out the medical records all over the floor so i could navigate them and i only realized that when i actually looked at all the separate admissions all the comments i i plotted it out on a timeline and the different diagnoses that came and went the different doctors when I looked at it from a bird's eye view, I was like, oh yeah, this actually makes a lot of sense. I see how that flowed into that and then that into that. But that didn't happen when I was receiving treatment. I don't think, I don't know if they read the prior notes or if they took a bigger picture view or, you know, they got a better sense of the holistic perspective outside of how I was presenting in the emergency room. Because it was just day by day, point by point. You don't realize you're in it when you're in it. Uh, and I don't think any of the people in my treatment team realized because it was just such a present moment thing. Um, but I, I think it also really, really um, clarified for me how common that is, that that's that kind of reactive intervention is how the system is built. It's not built to see people as whole human beings with whole stories that they bring to the table. Um, it's also not built in, in, uh, in a surprising way. It's not built to accommodate people with high need uh, where, 
you know, like I say, the, the more help I needed, the less help I got because I started to be, I started to encounter the stigma that's within the system. You know, I first, when I first went to hospital, it was a big to do and they had, uh, they, they uh, were all surprised. My mother had said, the nurse wrote in the medical records, we didn't see this coming. You know, Mark is a good boy as though being a good boy and, and having a hard time are two mutually exclusive things. But then by the end, nobody even really seemed to care anymore. So there's almost this this um, adoption curve or, or change management curve, or you just get used to it over time. You get used to seeing this kid come in uh, over and over again to the hospital. And I think that's the death knell uh, of any, but any kid or otherwise with complex needs is that when treatment providers get used to you being and apply a label identity of you being a person who struggles, they stop helping you as much. And I think that's started to be what happened to me. Yeah. You touched a little bit on the path that led you to the bridge. Uh, I don't know if it's important to talk more about that. I don't know. In one sense, it's it's an important part of your story. In another sense, most of your story, I think, is what happened after that. But is mm -hmm. there anything else you want to share about about that period before you got to the bridge? And and is there it to me when I when I read your story, it felt like it was it wasn't just one thing, right? It mm -hmm. was it was the sum total of a whole bunch of things, right? Well, and that was really my objective, uh, even before I wrote the book, even even as I was just kind of conceptualizing, what do I want people to really take away from this? And and I kept coming back to this idea. I never fully got away from this idea that mental illnesses don't come out of nowhere. They don't just happen that there's a reason, there's a context, even suicides, actually, in fact, especially suicides. And I think this is how we effectively tell, talk about suicide and tell our stories as people who have, are, are attempt survivors, is that it happens in a context. It's so easy, I think, not easy. It's, it's I understand why people want to feel like it came out of nowhere and they didn't see the signs and all this stuff, because it's too painful to think that you could have done things differently. Uh, and that's understandable. But I think that it was important to, to uh, help people to understand and break down stigma to realize that my mental health challenges uh, were understandable, I think, given the circumstances. Uh, and I think that's true. Uh, everybody has different circumstances, but I think that's generally true for most people, that there's a reason why the depression is taking root. It's trying to serve a function. It's try it, th there's something else happening there. Likewise for anxiety. Um, it, I think far more people have trauma histories than either they will admit or anybody else. Um, and, and I don't think that's uncommon at all. So I think that's, that was really the whole, the whole purpose of going so deep into the, the backstory of how I got to the bridge in the first place was that I think everybody uh, has an extensive history of how they get to where they are with a, a seemingly intractable mental health problem or illness. We shouldn't just conclude that, oh, they're just sick because their brain is broken. No, a lot of stuff has happened to get them to that point. Oh, absolutely. And a lot obviously did happen and people can can read the book to see the, the backstory. But um, one of the things you did uh, shortly after that moment on the bridge is you started writing about your experience and you started sharing your experience even while you were still in high school, mm -hmm. uh, which I found really interesting because that that would have taken a big leap, uh, especially, I mean, there's still a stigma about mental illness, but we go back 20 years, it was even mm -hmm. greater then, certainly, yeah. it's almost night and day. So how difficult a decision was that for you to start writing about this for your school paper and sharing it publicly with your peers? Yeah, you know, especially then and especially there, too, because I think it is different in small towns versus big urban centers uh, where it's easy to kind of get lost in the crowd. Um, but, you know, it's funny. I never really hesitated even then to open up about it because not not in a meaningful way that would ever stop me from doing it. Um, and I think that that was two. There were two reasons for that. One was that I felt like everybody knew my story already anyway. I'd been in and out of hospital so many times. Everybody heard the police calls on the police scanner. Um, you know, uh, I felt like everybody was, had talked about it anyway. And the other thing was that I had this kind of impulsiveness in me anyway that often worked against me uh, with respect to my suicide attempts and, um, you know, just kind of doing things. But I think that actually also worked in my favor as well. It was that, 
you know, I, I, I got out of the hospital that last time. I talked to my high school administration uh, about this desire that, that to talk about my story with my peers because I felt like the time, and I still think now, this, the um, stigma was worse than the symptoms. The symptoms were bad on their own, but feeling so alone and isolated and, and uh, shameful, uh, that was worse for me than, than the um, symptoms themselves. And I had already had a couple of people who kind of privately opened up about their stories to me too, because they knew what I was going through. Um, and if it wasn't for the high school uh, principal, the administration there saying no, that I couldn't, I uh, wasn't allowed to talk about suicide because if you talk about suicide, it gives people the idea to go out and do it uh, as though somebody had said to me when I tried to jump off that bridge, hey, have you thought about killing yourself? And I thought, no, but why don't I go do that? That's a good idea. Uh, that's not how it happened. There was this whole back half the book was backstory of how I got to that point. Nobody gave me the idea to kill myself. But I say in the book, lots of people gave me the idea not to talk about it, that it wasn't OK to talk about it. So I think that when I was told that I couldn't talk about it at school, that was just kind of the fire that lit under me uh, to open up anyway, to do it anyway. So I wrote this uh, op-ed to the Cape Breton Post, my local paper, and I opened up about my, my struggles, my experiences. I think I likened the high school administration to communist Russia for stifling my free speech. Um, it, you know, I, I just felt that I needed to do this, um, and I didn't see any reason not to. And one of my fears was that I would be ostracized because of that or seen as differently, but it really didn't pan out because as soon as that published, uh, the next morning there were television news cameras in the principal's office asking why it wasn't okay to talk about mental health in school and suicide specifically in school. Uh, and then other people who saw the story from all over my hometown and all over the Maritimes, in fact, started sending me messages and talking to me and sharing their stories too and telling me that they had been through it personally or their mother or their wife or their brother or their, their uncle um, you know, they started sharing with me all these stories. And I realized in that moment that people wanted to talk about these challenging issues. The problem was that nobody was inviting them to. And I didn't think that that was necessary. Why not? That's something we can control. We're faced with this situation of mental health stigma, and we can make a choice to stand on the sidelines or to reach out. I had become the person who reached out. So I think that for me, it was just a, it, it was a, um, an imperative uh, inside me uh, to open up. And I, I really didn't hesitate. So that was the beginning of your advocacy. Was it also the beginning of, of kind of a recovery and healing for you as well? Was that, was that the starting mm -hmm. point, do you think? I think it was. And my advocacy and my recovery are inextricably uh, tied up in one another. Uh, I think realizing that um, my, my struggle could be my strength uh, and that I could make this into a passion, into a purpose. Uh, that's what I had been lacking uh, in, my, in my struggle, I think. It, was the, it came with a lot of loneliness and uh, feelings of incompetence, not having that kind of uh, purpose. And I'm not the type of person anymore, anyway, who believes that you just magically find your purpose. I think you build it over time. Uh, and that's exactly what I did, doing these little things like the, the newspaper stuff and then the television stuff uh, and then the the positive feedback loops of then hearing from other people uh, that would be the reinforcement to keep doing it to do it again right even while I was still experiencing symptoms I was still trying to find the treatment that worked for me I didn't figure that out until much later uh, and after a lot of trial and error so I, I think that um, if I didn't have my advocacy um, early on anyway uh, I think things could have gone very differently for me. I, I don't think I, my recovery would have uh, taken off if I didn't have something like that to live for. Can you describe your mental health today and how you support your own mental health? I mean, my mental health, uh, it was interesting when the um, uh, pandemic first hit. Um, I was kind of an introvert anyway, and also I had been through a fair amount of stuff. So I'd had the opportunity to uh, develop coping mechanisms that I felt like most other people didn't. Um, and I had, I had talked about this with a few other people who had mental illnesses as well. And many of them said, you know, we're actually doing okay. We're kind of better now because now other people are seeing what we go through every day, the isolation, the loneliness, the discomfort, the stress. Um, but also we had a kind of a lots of years of trial run at this already. So we've learned how to do this, uh, whereas other people maybe haven't. So uh, I, I think, you know, with this year being 
uh, has ended up being one of my happiest years yet, but I would have said that of many prior years too. So I, I think it's one of those things, my mental health today is the best it's ever been uh, because it's never been this uh, it, it's never been this year before, you know, every year of experience comes with more skills. It comes with more insight. It comes, and it's not even necessarily an age thing. It's just, you, you get the hang of it after a while. At first you learn, at first I learned uh, how to be really good at being depressed, you know, you, and, and that's a good skill to have because you recognize your symptoms and your signs. You recognize when you might be relapsing. I used to relapse at least once or twice a year, um, almost always in the spring for sure. Um, but then those get further and further apart over time too. And now I don't really, I haven't relapsed in a very long time. Um, but even when I did, I would realize, okay, I know how to do this. You know, this, this isn't a failure. It's just, there's just another cycle ar ar around this and that's okay too. So I, I think it just gets better every year and, uh, and, um, I celebrate that and that helps to amplify that gratitude. What have you learned through all of that, that you can share with others that, uh, other people who struggle with, with mental illness or even people who are healthy, but want to sustain and maintain their, their mental health. One of the reasons I called, and there were a few reasons for it, but one of the reasons I called the book so-called normal uh, is that I think we have implanted in us this idea that there's some objective goal of perfection out there or normalcy out there. And uh, both through doing the podcast and the book and talking to others, my advocacy work, I realized, Oh, everybody's just figuring it out as they go. Nobody really knows what the heck they're doing. Um, that, that there is no perfect version of normal. And I think why that was so profound for me uh, was because I, I was always striving to be healthy, to be happy, uh, to be normal. Uh, and I didn't realize that that didn't really exist, that I could be as I am uh, in a radical sense of acceptance. Um, so I think since realizing that, uh, and I try to communicate that to others too, that if you're struggling right now, that's okay. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but like, uh, and there's that, that old phrase, it's kind of an old phrase now in mental health that it's okay not to be okay. That's true. But I also think I would add to that. It's also okay to be okay. That just because you have a mental health problem or illness doesn't mean you have to cling to that. It doesn't have to become part of your identity. It doesn't have to be all of you. It's part of you and that's all right, but there are many other parts too. And we can celebrate those. We can, uh, we can be okay. We can be happy. Uh, and you don't have, you don't owe anybody an explanation for that. So, you know, I think that that's been a helpful lesson um, for me too, that I, I hope to help other people share. So many years after that moment on the bridge, uh, you did this TEDx talk and you talked about that story and uh, you decided to seek out the man in the light brown jacket who you, you know, in the moment, you never got his name or any identifying features about him other than the jacket. Um, and it turned out he was looking for you too. And you actually mm -hmm. got to meet. Can you, can you describe that meeting? Yeah, I mean, I remember, um, so after he saved my life, he just went on his way. And, and like you say, I, I, I recognized uh, at the time that he was wearing a light brown jacket. I could feel the heat of his body behind me, but that was about it. I didn't see his face because the way I was on the edge of the bridge. Uh, and I vaguely remembered his voice, but also it was this thing where I was so collapsed into myself that even if he was looking at me right in my face, I probably wouldn't have noticed or recognized because I was just so closed down. Um, and then I, I went on with my life and really didn't give him a second thought for years uh, until I think it was in grad school and I started to have dreams. I had a dream about him uh, and it was just kind of this, it was more a dream without vision, but with sound and with, with a, a, a kinetic kind of quality to it where I could feel his body and hear his voice, but I couldn't see him. And I think that was the very earliest seed of when uh, I started to think about him. And then after I did the TEDx talk in which I talk about him saving my life, still not knowing who he was, I didn't tell anybody that my secret as I stood on that famous red dot uh, was that I didn't, I didn't even actually know if he was real. I didn't know if I had just made him up in my mind as this kind of um, angel devil over my, over my shoulder, you know, with the guy on the sidelines and him. And uh, if it was just a convenient plot point that I had created in my own mind to make my own story make sense because I needed it to. Um, so then, uh, 
I, I had this profound feeling after the TEDx talk, especially since it was so popular, of being incomplete, that my story was incomplete. Uh, and that I needed to find this person to find out if he was actually real uh, or if I just made him up. So I had um, uh, uh, reached out to a few journalist friends who I knew who, because I, by that point I'd been working in, in media advocacy for, for several years. Uh, and I asked, you know, what the best way to find this person was. All I knew was that he was wearing a, a man with a light brown jacket in, uh, you know, the early 2000s in Cape Breton. I knew nothing else about him. Uh, and I asked, I applied for my um, police records to be released under a Freedom of Information Act request, which they denied uh, on the grounds that they can't disclose records about a minor. I appealed and said, I am the minor and under the legislation, you are allowed to give them to me, in fact. Um, and then they denied again. So I appealed to the uh, to the official body, which agreed with me and said, yeah, no, of course, you got to give him his own records. So, And that was another great example for me of how people are routinely deprived of their rights because they don't know what their rights are. Uh, and they don't realize that you can push back against power. Uh, I'd learned that because of, I think, my experiences with mental health. Uh, but then I found I got the records and there was no reference to him anyway. Uh, There's a bunch of records missing and all kinds of stuff. I pulled the medical records. He wasn't in there. Uh, so then I, I um, was emailing with um, Andre Picard uh, from the Globe and Mail. And I was just kind of bouncing some questions off him. And uh, and then I just got this urge and I this or this realization that, you know, I've been doing stuff in public now. I've been public about my illness and about his story. Uh, and that seems to get great response from people. So why don't I just ask the public to help me find this guy? It, it wasn't some big grand plan. I fired off an email to a producer at Canada AM, which was then on the air. Uh, and I'd been on a couple of times by that point. And I said, I, I've I got this idea. I want to find this stranger that I talk about in the TED Talk. Um, who saved my life, and I don't know really anything else about him. And the producer responded almost right away. He said, great, let's do it. <laughs> and I went up to the studio. I said I wanted to do it the day after Bell Let's Talk Day because I'm a big supporter of Bell Let's Talk Day, but I'm also a big supporter of talking every day. Um, so I went up like 5 o'clock in the morning or something, uh, went on, and they showed some clips from the TED Talk. I talked about the stranger. Um, I shared uh, my desire to find him on social media, on my Twitter and Facebook pages. And within about an hour, I start getting flooded with messages uh, from people who said uh, that they saw the story. This thing goes viral all around the world right away because it was morning news, too. So I guess it was easy to pick it up all around the world. Uh, and then I start getting messages from people who said they knew who I was talking about. Uh, one guy said he was his roommate at the time. And the stranger came home and told him about everything that had happened. Uh, and then another guy who said he was his uh, brother-in-law or another relation, and uh, they'd been sharing the story for more than a decade among the family that, that this guy was a hero. Uh, and he was the one who told me that it turned out the stranger had seen my TED Talk uh, a week before I went on national television looking for him, uh, and that he had already written me a letter in case someday he ever found me. Because it turned out he didn't know if I had just gone back to the bridge the next day after he saved my life and finished what I'd started. Um, and he, they asked if they could send me the letter. I agreed. And, and they did. And his very first words to me, uh, I flicked on the camera on my iPad and recorded myself reading this letter. So, Mark, if you ever want to see somebody really ugly crying on YouTube, you can look up this video of me. Um, <laughs> because his very first words were, hi, Mark. My name is Mike. And that was I, it was at that moment that I realized that he was real because he had a name and he never had a name before. He was just kind of an, a figure in my mind. And he told me about how he didn't know if I just went back the next day. He told me about how scared he was in that moment because he wasn't a mental health professional. He wasn't a crisis worker or anything like that. He, all he could do was focus on my fingers on the railing. Uh, and, and Mike said that, um, when he approached the railing and looked over, it made him sick to see the world from my perspective. And I realized in that moment that that's what kept me there, him talking to me uh, about seemingly the most banal, meaningless things, uh, but that he was connecting with me because he took the time to see the world from my perspective, which I felt like nobody else had done. Um, so af after he sent me that letter and, and I read it, I knew we, we had to meet and we uh, flew him up to Toronto 
Uh, we put them up in a beautiful hotel suite at the at the Shangri-La because it turns out if you tell people a really good story in an email, they just give you a bunch of free stuff. <laughs> so the Shangri-La Hotel gave them a beautiful suite. Yeah, everybody wants stuff. to be part of the story at that point, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly. No. Exactly. Which yeah. was great because I yeah. it, it was they were very comfortable, and we brought along the Canada M cameras along again because we figured we started this in public, we might as well finish it in public, uh, and we met in downtown Toronto in in uh, Nathan Phillips Square. And uh, as soon as Mike saw me, and as soon as I saw him, I recognized him. And I hadn't seen him before, uh, but just something in me recognized something in him. And the first thing he did was walk straight toward me, looked directly in my eyes, and uh, he wrapped his arms around me again like he did the last time we were together. Uh, and he hugged me. And I told Mike that I had no idea how I could possibly thank him. How do you thank somebody for not only saving your life, but he'd been the role model that had given me my whole life. I modeled my life after being like him. So the best thing I told him I could do was just show him the life that he had given me. Uh, and I introduced him to my wife and uh, to my then two-year-old little boy. And uh, now he's my second little boy's godfather. And he hasn't met my little girl yet, but I hope he will soon. <laughs> and I talk to him about, uh, you know, my hobbies and my interests and my work and my all the stuff that I was interested in that we talked about on the bridge that night that I never thought I would ever be allowed to have. So, you know, I, I think being able to finally show him the life that he made possible to me brought that whole story deep inside me uh, to to a to a completion, uh, and and it felt right. And he's a part of your life now. Yeah, so way. I mentioned he's, yeah. he's my uh, second son's godfather, and we still talk from time to time. I had the opportunity actually to interview him in person when we were still allowed to travel and, and talk to people in person. Um, I interviewed him uh, uh, for my podcast, uh, and it was the first time that I really actually got to go deep into the into the meat of my story again with him. Mm. Um, I sent him updates about the book. He was incredibly supportive on on that front as well, and willing to be uh, to be included in it because, of course, I talk about Mike in the book, um, and I shared that email that he that he sent to me as well. You know, he, he's just been such a um, wonderfully supportive person, and it, and it turns out actually he's been working in crisis intervention with young boys ever since that time he's been working in group homes and still in Nova Scotia so you know I think we so impacted each other that night on the bridge in in such a meaningful way I'll, I'll forever be grateful to him for that yeah that's a, a great part of the story too the fact that that his path forward from that night was also to help other people uh, yeah. and and that's not what he was doing at the time right so it was it, it was it began that night right the, yeah yeah incredible yeah, yeah. and you know he it's such a he did it in such an authentic way. And it's not hard. Like I, I, I get a bit of an understanding when I um, interviewed him for my podcast that he had a bit of background in kind of a, uh, I don't think it was Big Brothers, Big Sisters, but it was a similar kind of mentoring type program where his whole job was just to connect with young people and get to know them. And I think that that skill set um, that child and youth workers have, that that mentors have, is so undervalued because that's what young people especially, but I think people of every age, that's what they need most. They need connection. They need people. They need to feel seen, to be seen, and to feel seen. Um, and that's what he did for me. That so many of those doctors and you know psychologists and psychiatrists and social workers and nurses and uh, so many other people I had talked to, uh, for the most part, I felt like didn't really see me in the same way that 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 Mike did in that very brief time we were together on the bridge. And you went back to the bridge too. Uh, and, I did. Yeah, and uh, I looked the bridge up on on Google Maps and and tried to kind of physically put myself there as best as I could using digital technology. And it's a mm -hmm. you know it's kind of a nondescript sort of bridge in in Sydney, Nova Scotia. And and mm -hmm. uh, but it's actually as you wrote in the book quite close to your grandmother's house, right? It is. Um, well, and and I ref I've reflected so much on that over the years, the the placement of it. I mean, on the one hand, where else would I go, right? It, it, the the um, bridge is a uh, two kind of, or it's two bridges kind of, but as part of one overpass. And it, it connects uh, two communities, Whitney Pier and the rest of the city of Sydney. I grew up on the Whitney Pier side or the wrong side of the tracks as, as we know it locally, uh, because there's a big, a, a massive, or used to be a massive steel plant in between the two communities. And Whitney Pier kind of grew up as a, as a bedroom community of working class people who worked at the plant. And most of my family uh, included, uh, both of my grandfathers. Um, 
but by the time I was growing up, the plant had closed. It was all still there, but it was dilapidated and falling down and, and toxic. The, the um, Sydney tar ponds are one of the worst toxic waste sites in North America. Uh, were. I mean, they probably still are, but they're under a nice, uh, well-groomed field of grass right now, but they're probably still pretty toxic. Um, but we grew up there. And I think the reason why that bridge was significant to me, and that's something that we know in suicidology, uh, suicidology research right now, uh, is that many suicide hotspots have a significance, that they're not random, that the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, or formerly the, the uh, Bloor Street Viaduct here in Toronto, these were such high suicide magnets for a reason. It wasn't random. And for me, the reason that I went to the, I think the reason that I went to that overpass was because as I looked out over that abandoned steel plant uh, from the wrong side of the railing, uh, it, it looked um, closed down and empty. And this place where people had found so much meaning and work and purpose, and here it was just forgotten and alone. And I felt like I didn't have a person to connect with that feeling in me, but I connected with that place. That place understood me, uh, that I felt toxic and useless and worn out inside. So I, I you know, I, I think that's why uh, I went there. Uh, and the bridge is, is still there. Like you say, I, I went back um, after I, I, uh, Mike and I connected uh, because I wanted, I felt strongly that I wanted to bring my mother back to that place because I, you know, one of the, one of the, um, threads throughout the book uh, is, I think anyway, my mother's uh, development um, as a character, as a person, her own journey toward individuation. I always asked myself as a kid, you know, how could she possibly keep going back to this environment? My stepfather, who, uh, you know, the emotional stuff that he put us through, leaving and coming back so many times. And, and you know, I, I didn't realize until writing the book that I had gone a couple of months when we moved out. We moved out for one point to three months and I didn't go to the hospital once. I didn't have any crises during that time. But then we moved back and within, I think, two weeks or something, I was back in the hospital like three times in a row or something like that. Um, so I think that there was something very contextual about that place and the trauma that I experienced there. Uh, and I never fully understood why she kept going back until much later when I saw that she was on her own journey too. And, and I brought her back to the bridge as a way to try to make peace, I think, with herself that it wasn't her fault, that she didn't do anything wrong to me. Uh, and I think she always carried that guilt with her. Um, so we went back and we had a, a we brought cameras along because <laughs> that's what I do, I guess. Uh, and, and some cameras captured some of that. Um, and then uh, uh, a few weeks after we came to that really beautiful moment of closure, her and I on the bridge that night uh, was when she died unexpectedly. And I couldn't help but feel profound gratitude, even through my grief, uh, that we had the opportunity to um, bring that story to closure. Uh, you know, that, that we had impacted each other in such a profound way, my mother and I, uh, in so much more, many more ways than just a, a mother and son, uh, that it was almost like her work here was done. And maybe that was just the narrative I was telling myself to grieve, but it was almost like we did what we had to do. Uh, she served uh, her role in my life, I guess, and many other lives, uh, and it was time for her to to move on. Uh, so I think that was an important part of my grieving uh, process was that realization that we finally had the ability or we finally had the opportunity uh, to bring that story to a close. You said in your TEDx talk, sometimes it doesn't matter what you know, what you feel just takes over. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about that? And maybe um, for, for people who have never experienced a mental illness, take them inside what the experience is like. Yeah, you know, we're, I think um, humans are animals. Um, we're, we're impulsive, we're instinct driven. Um, very often we just chug through our days on autopilot. We all do that, whether you have an illness or not. It's, it's normal actually that, your brain, your mind is supposed to take shortcuts. If you had to approach every day as though it was your first day on earth, that would be exhausting for your brain and, and for your mind. Um, so we take shortcuts and make assumptions and, and have cognitive biases all the time. That's normal. I think where it becomes problematic, where it became prob problematic with me, and this is the difference, I think, between sadness and depression or between stress and anxiety, uh, it's, a, it's a difference not necessarily of uh, magnitude, uh, but on stickiness and persistence. You know, some people might really enjoy running on a treadmill for 20 minutes or even two hours. 
but most people probably wouldn't enjoy if they're chained to the treadmill for two weeks or two months or two, 20 years, right? So I think that's the difference with mental illnesses, that when you're collapsed into that place, it's not as easy as saying, just snap out of it or just think differently, um, because you can't. And sometimes you can't even see outside of that narrow lens that you're in. Um, so I think then the way that we... Um, uh, the way that I um, was able to drag myself out of that was through these small iterative processes where you're changing your habits. Uh, depression is a habit in many ways. As much as it's an illness, and we like to talk about it in an illness framework, I don't think that's particularly helpful for people's recovery. Uh, and it's not even actually doesn't have a lot of science um, to support it. Depression, of course, is an illness. Mental illnesses are real. Don't Don't get me wrong. But the way that we get out of them is not as easy as just taking an injection or a pill, that we have to do so much more cognitive restructuring uh, and learning uh, to change our brain uh, to get out of these places. And it's because of that idea that, that we get stuck and it's that stickiness. So that's, that's um, I think, why the TEDx talk was so popular because um, at that time, and I still think now to a certain degree, you don't usually hear it framed quite like that, that the experience of mental illness from the inside is a stickiness of thought. It's a stickiness of feeling that you can't just shake it off, uh, that there's something blocking you um, from, from resolving whatever that emotion or, or thought is. Um, and I hope that helps people to, to uh, when they can conceptualize their, their struggle in that way, to uh, tackle the solutions in a new way too. How do I get unstuck from this place? Medication might be part of that. You know, uh, it was for me, um, but for many people, it's not. And I think we need to, to uh, meet people where they are uh, and uh, whatever works for them, celebrate that because if it works, it works. And we should be grateful for that. You wrote, over time, you will learn to struggle well. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it struck me that that is a, a, a great message for anybody suffering from a mental illness, but it's a, just a great message generally. I mean, isn't that the secret to life in a way, that to learning to struggle well, not learning to avoid the struggle, yeah. but learning to struggle well? Well, resilience isn't about avoidance. If you're avoiding, you're not resilient. You're scared of something. Resilience is about how you rest and recharge and repeat. <laughs> That's what resilience is. It's a process. It's a spiral. Um, I, I use the the whirlpool image in the in the book a lot of my struggles, or the spiral down. That you know things would get things would build on each other, whether it be my thoughts or my feelings or my behaviors, and get worse and worse and worse and worse. And I wasn't helping myself by any means. But then when things turn around, things can spiral up too. You can get things better and better and better. You can build successes on each other. Uh, and I think that's from a, from a properly strengths-based um, recovery uh, approach. That's how we get better. We don't get better by just avoiding struggle or just solving the symptoms. Instead, if we can actually amplify the good things that can help to negate some of the negative things too, some of the struggles. And, and that's where I think we can really help to improve the quality of life of people struggling with mental health problems and illnesses. You can have a mental illness and thrive. You can even have a severe and persistent mental illness and thrive because whether you're suffering or thriving doesn't necessarily depend on your symptoms. It depends on your supports. It depends on your environment. It depends on your mindset in some ways. And that's something that can be learned uh, and acquired uh, and it can be incredibly helpful. I know that it certainly has been for me. Is it possible to understand how much of both mental illness and the recovery from mental illness has to do with circumstances, your environment, uh, genetics, uh, chemicals in your, mm -hmm. in your body? Is it, do we even know really, is it, is it possible to comprehend that? I think it, it will be possible, and we're certainly learning more and more every day. Um, I think that uh, it, it needs to be uh, a comprehensive view of all of the things you just mentioned. Uh, a biopsych anybody who doesn't, uh, or anybody who works in either mental health advocacy or mental health uh, research or clinical practice, who doesn't have what's called a biopsychosocial orientation, uh, they're not serving their, their clients well. So this idea that uh, there's a biological component to mental health. We know that. Of course, you can see depression in the brain. You can see everything in the brain. If you experience it, it has to go through your brain. Your entire body is a life support system for your brain. Nothing can get in or out without going through that door. So yes, you can see depression and every other mental illness has impacts on the brain. 
Uh, but you can also see when you learn something new in the brain, because it, by definition, there has to be a structural change in the brain in order to acquire new knowledge. That's how learning works. Uh, it's called neuro, neuroplasticity. That's how everything works. Um, so there has to be that biological piece. There also, however, has to be a psychological piece. Uh, our entire world is built by our distorted cognitions and how we see the world. You can't see the world in a perfectly objective way. You're not a computer uh, or a camera, uh, that it has to go through every, every single past experience you've ever had influences how you see the world right now. Even basic things like your mood uh, or how hungry you are or how well you slept last night, all of that changes how you see the world around you, the lens that you have. And we know that we can change that lens uh, through cognitive restructuring, through cognitive behavioral therapy, through skills that we learn, that's a skill. Uh, but then there's the social piece as well. Uh, we know that if you're, um, if you're not sure you're going to be able to make ends meet, if you're going to be able to put food on the table, if you're going to be able to pay your rent, uh, if you're consistently going into, the work, into a workplace that has toxic levels of stress, uh, if you're um, uh, facing any number of other social stressors in your life, that's going to negatively impact your mental health, understandably. So all three of those things, the biological piece, the psychological piece, and the social piece, they all feed off of one another. Uh, and if you try to focus on one without focusing on the others, uh, then you're probably not going to experience a whole lot of success. So I, I think that that all three of those factors play off each other and, and need to be considered in how we think of mental health. Because you've been such an advocate for mental health, and you've been very outspoken about the system and about some other issues, I just wanted to get some thoughts from you on number one, how the system needs to change. You've touched on it a little bit already, but mm -hmm. but what do you think we need to need to do differently as a society in our approach to mental illness? I think there are two important pieces here. One is uh, greater access to psychotherapy, uh, and the other is having a, a much more sophisticated, targeted, uh, personalized system of stepped care in mental health. Uh, so I'll start with that one first. Um, not everybody with every mental ache and pain needs to go to the most specialized, the highest paid, the uh, fewest in number uh, of professionals, psychiatry. That's often the, the answer of uh, politicians and even advocates. We need more psychiatrists. We need more uh, beds in psych hospitals. Okay, we probably do to a degree, but how we're using those resources is not very efficient at all. Um, People with mild to moderate depression, for example, uh, can experience recovery just fine without ever seeing a psychiatrist. Uh, and they're also uh, extremely limited in number. Even in downtown Toronto, uh, wait lists for psychiatry can be 12 to 18 months. And we have more psychiatrists in Toronto per capita than anywhere else in Canada. So numbers are not the issue. It's efficiency of the system. And if we're matching the level of need that people have to the specialization of the, of the professional who's offering it. Um, what that also means and this ties into public uh, broader public availability of psychotherapy, is that there are thousands and thousands of highly qualified mental health professionals who are now essentially waiting on the sidelines uh, because people can't afford them or because they're not um, embedded into uh, robustly enough into mental health care services um, or because other people who either aren't qualified or are differently qualified are responding to the types of, of issues that they should be responding to, namely when police are called to, to uh, deal with mental health crises. A police officer isn't a psychologist or a social worker or a psychiatrist. Why would they be responding to a, a, a mental health crisis? It doesn't make any sense. And especially when you think of it could go the other way, it could the, go the wrong way real quick and, and often has. Um, so I think that's the other piece. If we were to make um, psychotherapy publicly funded uh, across Canada, uh, that would significantly move the needle, I think, in a way that we have not been able to do thus far in mental health in this country. Because we know that psychotherapy, the vast majority of, of uh, uh, manualized psychotherapies are evidence-based. Uh, they work uh, very often better than medication does, especially for things like depression and anxiety, but also for even severe and persistent mental illnesses. So we need to have uh, uh, publicly funded psychotherapy. It's medically necessary, uh, just as if not more medically necessary than access to a family doctor. And in fact, it'll relieve a, a great deal of pressure uh, off of other areas of the system. So I, I think those two areas would be, would be key uh, uh, focus points, uh, psychotherapy and, and having a properly segmented 
uh, well-organized system, not so much a blunt instrument that tries to cram everybody into the same box. Hmm. You've also been very outspoken about the issue of medically assisted dying, uh, which is a, a very relevant issue in Canada right now. And as mm -hmm. we speak, it's even being debated in Parliament. But the, the issue of mental illness as, as examined through that kind of lens is an interesting one because mm -hmm. there is an, an argument that I think a lot of people make that mental illness is as legitimate and real as physical illness and that they should yep. be looked at the same way. And yet there are people who feel that while it is logical for someone who is suffering from a painful physical illness uh, with no hope of recovery, should be able to speak to a doctor and choose to end his or her own life, that somebody with a mental illness that is, physic that is, that is uh, causing a lot of suffering should not necessarily be allowed to make the same choice. Mm -hmm. uh, can you just share your, your feelings on sure. this and why you feel that way? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, for me, uh, there's no question that mental illnesses are real illnesses. Of course they are. And I think that when this is where, when I talk about the level of mental health awareness that we're at in society right now is so rudimentary uh, that so many people don't understand the differences, right? That, um, that, that we need to come to a more sophisticated view uh, of mental health awareness, wherein when people say depression is just like cancer, the original goal of that phrase was to um, to raise equity, so that way depression is treated as seriously as cancer, uh, which we know, according to the World Health Organization, major depressive disorder can be as disabling as even quadriplegia. It's an incredibly disa disabling illness. Um, so there's no question of uh, uh, the suffering that gets that is caused by mental illnesses. The problem, however, is the question around uh, A, uh, does that person need to be suffering the way that they are comparably to, to other illnesses? And B, if it can be made better. So the question around irremediability. This is another one that, um, in my view, uh, um, lib more libertarian leaning people uh, who want to give uh, everybody uh, the right to, for a doctor to end their life uh, regardless, uh, aren't fully appreciating the fact that there is zero medical evidence to show that mental any mental illness is irremediable. That's the difference. When people say depression is just like cancer, we were originally asking for equity. It somehow translated down to depression is just like cancer. No, it's not. Depression is not like de depression is not like cancer. Depression is like depression. We need to be able to get to a point in in mental health advocacy where we realize that these illnesses are different. You don't treat them the same. If you get stage four cancer, you are going to very likely going to die, and there is nothing else left that the medical system can do to help you. If you have an equivalent of say stage four uh, depression. There is no equivalent because I can guarantee you, I've seen it a hundred times. You go through that person's health um, uh, case history. The system has failed them at every turn. They haven't gotten the preventative care. They haven't gotten access to maybe the medications that they need or the social supports. There is no publicly funded psychotherapy. Maybe they've never even seen a, a psychotherapist. Um, there's very high likelihood we see people with severe and persistent mental illnesses uh, often have no job because of their illness. They often have no home because of their illness. These are social failings. And worse, they're social failings that we know how to fix. I'm not disputing the fact that people are suffering uh, grievously with mental illnesses. What I'm disputing is that they don't have to be. So it's almost like, um, I've used this analogy before, of a hostage taker uh, kidnaps you and tortures you and then offers you the perverted mercy of saying, well, I could kill you instead, and then you would be relieved of your suffering. But you're suffering because of the hostage taker. And this is what's happening to mentally Ill, uh, people with mental illnesses in Canada is that they're held hostage by a system that not only is not uh, not only is broken, it was never designed right in the first place. So the system does not help people. It takes them hostage. It makes them suffer. Uh, so then no wonder they feel like they need to end their life. As to the, the question around somebody's right to end their life, they already have that right. Suicide isn't illegal, nor should it be. Um, so one of my main concerns uh, that, that comes up from some organizations and some policymakers is that, well, it's cleaner this way. Really? You're going to sanitize suicide because it makes you uncomfortable? That it's messy? How about we help people to recover? 
I think that we need to do a much better job before. And I don't even oppose medical assistance in dying. Now I'm on my soapbox. I don't even oppose <laughs> medical assistance in dying in principle. So this isn't a partisan thing or a religious thing or anything like that. If, if it makes sense, fine. Um, but in no case of mental illness does it make sense uh, because uh, there are treatments available that help people that they don't have access to uh, that that might be expensive for the system. But until the system, until the government starts investing in actually helping people to recover, that's the first step. And then if it turns out, no, you know what, people really, uh, there is a, a, an, an analogous experience to stage four cancer in depression where there's medically nothing more we can do, then we can approach that bridge. But we don't jump there yet because we're just not there in the research and no credible scientist will tell you that we are. If you see a scientist who tells you that mental illnesses are conclusively from a scientific perspective irremediable, they are lying. There is no medical evidence to support that. So uh, that's why I can't in good conscience yeah. uh, support medical assistance in dying for mental illness. It's not a rights issue. Uh, it's a, a matter of, of people are uh, with mental illnesses have historically uh, been uh, abused and taken hostage by the system like this. And this is modern day eugenics. I don't think it's fair. Uh, be, and, and it's not, in fact, in uh, building up people's rights. It's taking away more rights than it's granting. Okay. Last question, Mark. No, I, I'm glad to hear you talk about that. I think it's really important to hear that perspective. Um, treating mental illness as equivalent to cancer is different from treating it as the same as cancer. Right. So that's an important point. Um, you must reflect from time to time on the life you've had since that moment on the bridge and hmm. how close you came to not having that. Uh, what, what kinds of feelings do you go through when you look at that very significant life or death turning point uh, uh, when you were 15? You don't realize how far you've come until you have the opportunity to look back. And I think that moment, it didn't really fully hit home for me until my mother died. That, that, uh, and, and then the year or two years, really, uh, of grief uh, that followed that. Um, that it helps to shake you out of this this uh, lot being locked in to the present moment in two way in in too great of a way. You know, I think it's great to be present and all that stuff. We talk about that from the mindfulness tradition all the time. But if you get so locked into your moment that you realize that you have a bigger life, that you're part of a bigger world, that this is just one uh, trip around the sun, that there will be others. Um, I think that has helped me. Uh, to realize that all of it counts, that all of it is my story, that as soon as I get stuck on, I wish that didn't happen to me, or, or as I experienced at the time, you know, this feeling of being raised Irish Catholic, uh, that it, maybe it was just my cross to bear, the suffering was just part of the, the thing. I, as soon as you get, get um, hooked on that thought loop uh, of that you're just destined to suffer, or I don't want it to be this way, well, it is. And I think there's a, a wonderful tradition in mindfulness, and it's been brought into the uh, dialectical behavior therapy and, and other methods of, of therapy of acceptance and change, that it is what it is. It didn't have to be, sure, but, who, but it is. Um, so now what are you going to do with it? And I think that's been the mantra that has um, kind of been the drumbeat behind my entire recovery, even if I didn't know it at the time. Well, what are you going to do now? That didn't work out. What are you going to do now? This is really awful okay, what are you going to do now? <laughs> like, it's always just one step after the other until eventually you realize that you're not the person you were anymore. You wouldn't be who you are if not for who you were, but you're not that person anymore. And that's okay. You don't have to cling to that identity. I, I think that's what I've realized from looking back at, at the kid that I was, um, that I'm grateful to that kid and for that kid for what he'd been, he, he, he had been through. Um, because it made me who I am. And maybe there would have been easier ways to get here, but I like who I am now. Uh, so I'm, I'm grateful uh, in a strange way, maybe for the struggle. I'm grateful for the suffering um, because I've learned so much from it. So it, it has taught me gratitude. And if that was the point, if there is a purpose <laughs> to all this stuff, uh, then I'm grateful for that purpose. One step at a time until you realize you've walked a long way from that spot on the bridge, right? Yeah. 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 
one of my one of my uh, mother's worries she was still alive when i first started looking for mike was that if i i dug around in my past uh, i would go back there and you know when after i left for college and started going home to visit uh, there's that old realization that you can never go home again right because it's not the same place that it was when you were a kid and i think that that was true for me too revisiting some of my old uh, demons or struggles or challenges or whatever is is that it it does bring you back there in a way and it's hard uh, but you realize that you've come so far uh, and that you've done so much since then and you've been spiraling up or sideways or in some other direction um, but you can never step in the same river twice <laughs> Heraclitus uh, uh, wrote and I think that's true in anybody's life. So I hope that everybody um, sees the bigger picture of the narrative story arc of their life uh, and realizes that they get to decide uh, what that story means to them because they're the only, you are the only person uh, that matters uh, in the telling of your story. Yeah, it makes me think of that T.S. Eliot quote, uh, at the end of all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. I, it sounds like that's the journey you've been on in writing this incredible book. And and we can we can do that with others too. You know, the spiritual teacher Ram Das uh, has said is known for having said uh, that we're all walking each other home. I think that's true. We're all on our own trip, we're all on our own journey and recognizing to other people that everybody else is on the exact same journey that you are. There is no secret out there that everybody else has access to and you don't. The secret version of perfect normal that you're all, we're all walking each other home. And, and I think we have an obligation to each other to be kind and gentle, gentle and grateful uh, in how we do that with others. Mark, this has been incredible to hear your story and your own words like this and, and all the powerful lessons you have to share. Thank you so much for writing that incredible book and, and sharing your message in your TEDx talk and for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Mark. It was a great conversation. Wow, what an emotional journey that was. I really admire Mark's raw candor in sharing his story. I have volunteered to support mental health initiatives for almost 20 years, and I can tell you Mark's perspective is fresh, it is inspiring, and it is changing lives. His lessons about gratitude and turning your struggle into a strength are very powerful to me, and I have to tell you, I found that story of the man in the light brown jacket to be incredibly compelling and inspiring. So once again, thank you to Mark Hennick for joining us on Digging Deep. If you enjoyed this episode, please review it. Please share it with others. That will help us produce more great episodes. And if you want to keep digging deep into topics and lessons like this, if you want to see the show notes, subscribe to our weekly newsletter, or read my daily blog, you can do all of that at letsdigdeep.com. Let'sdigdeep.com. Thank you for listening.